Here lies the old me. The kid my parents wanted me to be. All the ways the world hurt me. Goodbye to my fears and anxieties. The reason why my ex left me. Rest, Rest in, in peace, peace to the old, old me. Welcome everybody in the room, everybody tuning in online at all the Ports Live locations in Houston, North Houston, Des Moines, Boise, Cedar Rapids, Iowa, Tulsa, Oklahoma, Scottsdale, Arizona, Indianapolis, Greater Lafayette, and all the different live locations. We're continuing the series, RIP to the old me. What does that mean? The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, in Christ, you and I have new life, and God when you trusted and put your faith in Jesus, is now producing and bringing about this new life that he has started. And so we sing, rest in peace to old ways and our old life. And so through this series, we've been talking about that. Let me set the table for what we're gonna talk about tonight. When I was at uh, Texas A&M and one of my last ever student, uh, <laughs> shocker, didn't see that coming. When I was at A&M at one of my last spring breaks, me and three of my closest friends decided we're gonna go on a spring break road trip. And so we, on the day before we left, got out, got together, the four of us, and we took a coin, we flipped it and said, if it's heads, we're going east. If it's tails, we're gonna go west and we'll figure it out as we go. And it landed where it was heads and so we're gonna go east. And here's how we decided where we were gonna go. Each person of the four of us got to choose a city we'd go to. And so, uh, because one person wanted to see Graceland and Elvis, I still to this day don't understand exactly why, we went to Memphis, and we're walking to Memphis, and then we went to Charleston, because one of the guys had family in Charleston, and then another guy was like, even though it's way out of the way, we should go to Florida, because I'm dating a girl in Florida, and we were like, no, and he was like, yes, and we are like, all right, Romeo, we're going to Florida, and then <laughs> we ended up going to Knoxville in Tennessee and staying with other friends, and each person in the car was a part of shaping the direction and destination of that car. Why do I start there? Because that car is a metaphor for really your life and my life. The people that are closest to you and journeying with you are going to shape the direction and destinations you're gonna end up at and be a part of. And it won't be as clear as just, hey, we're going to Memphis, but it will be as clear as the type of marriage you'll be a part of someday will be shaped by the girls closest to you, if you're a girl, by the guys closest to you. The type of character you're building right now is being shaped. Sadly, a lot of us have been driving in what feels, to use the metaphors, that we're all alone in that car. And we're going through life and not experiencing the peace and we're experiencing disappointment and a loneliness that's leading to all kinds of other problems in our life. And God, throughout his word, is emphatically clear. He created and designed us to experience intimate relationships together. The adage, show me your friends, I'll show you your future, is something that you see all throughout the Bible. And tonight, we have a chance to hear from a dear friend of our ministry and a woman who is leading a ministry along with her husband that is one of the most influential and impactful I know of, period. And her name is Jenny Allen. And Jenny is gonna join us, and she just released a book that I could not more highly encourage, and we're about to talk and all about it, but you guys help me welcome to the stage Jenny Allen. Hey. Hey, you're back. Oh, good to be back. Hey, awesome. Okay, like I said, Jenny just released a book, Find Your People, all about really addressing that idea of loneliness, Community is what we call it around here, but it's just intimate relationships that God, all throughout the Bible, says are not just, it shouldn't be something uh, that you add on or consider, but prioritize inside of your life. Yeah. And as I said before, loneliness really is at an epidemic. Every, every month, if not every week, people are emailing in and writing in and just saying, I feel so disconnected, yeah. I feel so alone, and the pandemic did not help. And But yeah. really, as you talk about in the book, this is an issue that's been going on long before the pandemic and certainly contributed to it. And so I want to start by just saying, what are the factors or how did we end up here? Yeah. Well, first, I just want to say, hey, Porsche, it's good to be here. 
And I genuinely feel like this is always just coming home. I know it's my home church, but y'all are my favorites. Don't tell any of the other <laughs> ministries. Being here with you, I love it. So it's so good to be here. And I am so grateful I have my, my kids here tonight from Texas A&M. And, and a lot of my very closest people tonight were actually, um, yeah, I just feel really blessed to be here. So, yeah, what's the problem? I mean, it is a big problem. I would guess, I kind of want to ask the question because I like to ask y'all questions, but this one's a little more tender to say, do you feel lonely? It's a little more tender. It's a, it's a harder question to answer. Interestingly enough, it's actually harder to answer than do you feel anxious? And I think the reason it's harder to answer is because it feels like we look out and nobody else is lonely, but that's not true because the research says three in five people are lonely and that was prior to the pandemic. So my guess would be at this point, we're at four in five, if not five in five people feel disconnected. We have gotten to a place in our culture where loneliness is almost so normal that you don't even notice that you're feeling it. It is just part of the air that you breathe. Mm -hmm. It is something that, that you've lived with most of your lives and, and not every generation has. And so where this project actually came from for me was I was in Uganda and I was watching two women carrying buckets on their head to go gather their water for the day and they were cracking up. They were glowing and they were so happy and you could tell they were getting into trouble together. And I just remember thinking, I'm jealous. I'm jealous of two women that have to walk down the water who knows how, or down the path to get water who knows how long. I'm jealous of them because they are requiring each other to live. And every generation in every culture has required connection to survive. And we don't. We Amazon every single thing we need. We don't even borrow an egg from our neighbor. We are completely isolated from each other. And so we don't need each other, so we don't go to each other. Now, we hang out together, and we especially look like we hang out together on Instagram, but we don't need each other, and there's a huge difference. Mm. And the reality is, we know this. The right answer is we do actually need each other, but because we don't need each other to survive, and you're so jacked up, and I'm so jacked up, and we hurt each other so much, that it just gets to be too much trouble and it's like, eh, I don't think, I, I, I think I'd rather just see people in a, in a contained way, like I'll go to small group maybe once a month one, or once or twice, um, no crazy small groups, and then I'll do, you know, I'll do this thing or this thing, but I'm not going to truly live in day in and day out community. And, and honestly, this book was written in such a way that it was written to people that live that way all generations prior to us until the Industrial Revolution lived that way, and 80% of cultures today live in connected villages where they depend on each other day in and day out. This bothered me, and it worried me, because I'm thinking if we live in a little dot of history that's doing community and life completely different than it's ever been done, and we know the results are, you and I talk about this all the time, everybody's anxious, everybody's depressed, everybody's so heavy, then I think we have a huge problem. And so it made me curious and it made me worried. And so I thought, okay, let me just go start looking and start seeing how are we supposed to live. And the sad part was, David, is I felt like when I did the research, it was so broken that it felt like I don't even know how we change it just because we're so isolated. And I mean, I'm curious for you guys, because you're all sitting here together and I'm picturing you walking in with tons of friends, but I'm gonna go ahead and ask the brave question, like how many of you this week have felt lonely at some point? Okay, okay. I wasn't wrong, all right. <laughs> <laughs> everybody raise their hand for the people through the camera. Just, just one guy everybody. in the front row. Yeah. Uh, so one of the things that I, I really love in the book, so I've been in community for eight years with, with four other couples, and we harp in it a ton here. One thing that I really appreciate that I want to spend a decent amount of our conversation on is pushing through some of the barriers to opening up, to being real, to being authentic and all that stuff. 
and to taking wherever you're at on the spectrum more ground and deepening those relationships. But before we go there, you talk about the term deep community and how would you define that? And that's pretty broad and open-ended, but is there a way that you would say, hey, here's, here's kind of the future destination to begin pursuing? Okay, let's just start at the beginning. Genesis, man is on the planet and God says, it is not good for you to be. So I mean, what we're gonna talk about today, like my view on this, I'm gonna go ahead and say it up front. It's very radical compared to most people, what they would say and how you're living. But I would say deep community is in your day in and your day out life that every single thing about you is known, that you are not living in any secret, any secret. And I'm not just talking about sin, I'm talking about that anxious thought that has been bugging you all day. That every single thing about you is known by someone. Now you can't be known by a ton of people, but you could be known by two to five people, and we'll talk about the research in a minute. But two to five people is about how many people you could be in day in and day out life with. I'm talking about running errands together. It is not good for man to be It is not good for man to be alone. I'm talking about eating together. And I mean, I, I'm really sensitive to the fact that I have shown up talking about this to mostly singles. Amen. And I'm excited about it because I think actually, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you this too. I think you have the power to change this problem in our culture better than anybody else because you've got a little flexibility. And I think this brokenness that we have right now of, can I get off topic for just a minute come and come back? Okay, in the 19- Actually, I changed my mind, let's not. And I'm totally kidding, go. In the 1920s, there was a, re, a, a philosopher guy that really was a marketer who wanted to um, sell toasters. And he decided to create something called the nuclear family. It was two adults, two and a half kids. That was now the nuclear family. Prior to that, families were aunties, uncles. Have you seen In the Heights, that movie? Abuelas, okay, abuelas, abuelas. Abuelas that, that parented the whole street, right? It didn't matter if you were their kid or not. You got food, even though we don't have barely anything. You show up at my door, you're my kid. Call me Aunt Auntie. Um, that's how most of the world functioned. Family was the people around you that you loved. Wow. You lived in a village of, say, tops 150, usually about 100. Anytime you reach over 20, bear with me, anytime you reach over 25 kids, you'd start a new school that would create a new village. By nature of the size of a village, it would break off and start a new village. You wouldn't leave the village all your life. You'd grow up with all your grandparents and parents and siblings all of the days of your life. And all the people that you live with, they'd, they'd all be there too. And you'd barely leave 20 miles from your house all your days. That's, that's all of history, okay? And families took care of each other and families were friends and families were singles and, and they were adopted into families. You would have an abuela, you would have aunties, you would be an auntie, you would be an uncle. That's how it always was until America, somebody decided they wanted to sell more toasters. So they decided to go two adults, two and a half kids, that's a family, build a fence, get an alarm system, Sell a toaster, you need your own because you're not gonna borrow your auntie's next door because that's too far to walk and you gotta go over the fence and it, it's just trouble, so get your own toaster. And they sold toasters. And the whole idea worked. And this is why I think y'all could change the whole wide world. Because you could be an auntie. Like you could love people's kids, you could go into people's homes, mm -hmm. you could say I want you to adopt me. Like my parents live in, in I almost said Africa, sure, maybe. I mean, it's probably not very many of you, but yeah, so Africa. And you need, you need an abuela. You need somebody. Everybody knows what the word abuela means, right? It's grandmother. Okay, just making sure. <laughs> um, so, so you need that. We need this. This is the sadness for you, especially in this room. If anybody should be ticked off that this is the way the world went, it should be singles. Because we are not, you know, God said, it is not good for anyone to be alone. So something's broken. 
You're supposed to be a part of a unit. You're supposed to take care of your neighbors. You're supposed to take them a casserole. I don't know if you learned that yet, but we're in the South. If we don't know that, nobody knows that. We got to get that right. Like, I, I, you need to know how to make something with cream of mushroom and, and <laughs> rice. Like, that needs to be top of mind. Boys, too. Come on. Ritz crackers with some butter on top. Like, that's how it goes. That is how it goes. And when somebody's mother goes in the hospital, you know what? You don't know their mother, but you know them, and you take them, a eh? Teaching y'all something tonight. So what I know is because we're carrying the whole wide world's problems, right? How many problems did you read about today? Hmm. We don't take anybody a casserole because we're so tired because we heard the problems of the whole wide world. I'm worried about Ukraine. It's hard to care about my neighbor. So I can't remember your question exactly, but. <laughs> Toaster's answered it. Yeah, okay. it was good. <clears throat> no, it's, it's, it is so true. And Uber Eats and all the different yeah. things is only, it, it both comes with a blessing and a curse. The question was around deep community. Like, how would you define that? Because to your point, or you started with, this generation could change that. One of the ways they can change that is by being involved and being connected to local churches and other families that may not be biological families. But there are also some things that we can pursue that right. 100 years ago, they may have lived in a village with 100 people, but they may not, they still were not known. And right. a lot of that's really practically written in scripture and captured in this book. Yep. So I don't know if there is a definition you'd say is, here's what I mean by deep community. Well, I wanted to start with the problem because I think if we understand what's broken, yeah then we can start to imagine what could be. And if we can imagine how it was, and, and why I like to start with the problem and the cultural shift that we're a part of, is because it really kind of comes down to Ritz crackers and butter. Like, it actually comes down to doing life together in such a deep way that we don't miss each other, that we actually see each other, that we don't feel alone in the midst of a room like this because you know, for me, I've got about 12 people down here that I'm related to or is one of my dearest friends that they, for the most part, in the last two days, I've talked to all of them. Like, they're in my life. We're gonna go out to eat after this. Like, we, we're, we're doing life together. And so I think it starts by being known. And, and I wanna actually pull up, I will answer that question. Um, I wanna pull up the circles that describe these different things. So we know that, I mean, you're, you're Christians, a lot of you, and you know God's supposed to be in the center, right? I could give that speech, but I'm gonna not give it right now. <laughs> um, and that does matter a lot. Because if we go into relationships and try to get all of our needs met from each other, that's gonna always go poorly. That's, that's right. called codependency. You're putting your dependence on someone else and that can lead to all kinds of brokenness. So the reason God has to be in the center is, is if I go to those people that are in my life regularly and and say, meet a need for me, meet a need for me, meet a need for me, they pro it probably is never gonna happen. However, if I go and say, I love you, I'm here for you, today I need you to be here for me, that's okay. We can be needy. It's just that if we expect people to be God, it breaks down. Yeah. But outside of that, we've got an inner circle and then we've got acquaintances, acquaintances. That white circle in the middle is actually the village. It's actually the place where um, I would say about 50 people that you know by name, that you actually can um, think of, you know what, if something happened to them, I would want to help them. And the reason I wanna set this up first before I get to your answer is we've gotta understand what categories people fall in. Because if we're trying to take someone in our village that's in our 50s, say, and we try to put stuff them into our inner circle, it's going to feel awkward if we haven't seen them in three weeks and we're trying to confess our sin to them the first time we see them. Mm. And so what I'm saying, those, those, that, that circle, that inner circle of two to five people, that circle is scientifically what capacity we have. The 150, the acquaintances, that's typically what the size of a village would be and then the middle, the 50, would be the people that you'd actually be taking care of. My brother-in-law said, when I told him I was gonna do all this work on villages, he lives in a place that's kinda like a village off, off the radar, and he said, to your point, he said, well, yeah, that's great, and all, unless you wake up and you're in a village of cannibals. 
Fair and I point. was like, yeah, that's bad. Um, but, but what he means is people hurt you. Hmm. And, and no village is perfect. And our goal is not just to gather people around us or to live like people used to, right? The goal is to live as Christ called us to live. But because culturally we have under our feet something that's so broken, we gotta start with we need some practical pieces there that we haven't had. So if it's not good for man to be alone, then we shouldn't be eating alone, then we shouldn't be living alone, we shouldn't be spending all of this time alone, we should be bringing people in to our everyday lives. And I'm not saying it's wrong to live alone, I'm just saying you better know why you're living alone. And again, I'm gonna say some radical things tonight, but I would really question why are you living alone? Because there's a lot of people that are lonely. And it's easier to do life together if you're doing it in proximity with each other. But to your question, biblically, how do we do this? Let me start with this. Hebrews 10, verse 24. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. And then there's another passage where it says, we're gonna encourage each other as long as it is called today so that, our, so that we are not hardened by sin's deceitfulness. So there's a real result in not being together and encouraging each other. So there's a sense that we don't wanna be hardened. Do you know, have you ever been across with, from someone and they feel hardened to you? You may not use that word, but you just, if you thought about it, you probably would. But they just feel cold and they feel disconnected and they feel distracted and they feel like they just, they're not tender. They're listening to you and they're not empathetic. Anybody? I mean, I'm sure we've all been that person too, but I think we notice it more in someone else, right? Mm. So when that happens, that hardness, you're not connected. So there's a, there's a chicken and egg here in, in these verses that say, you've gotta to gather together and you've gotta encourage each other as long as it's called today. Stir up courage. You've gotta stir up courage so that you don't get hard. So that you don't get hardened by sin. So there's a sense that as we're going alone, we're getting hardened in our sin. Hmm. Our hearts are getting hard. Well guess who wants to be alone? Hard people. You wanna be alone. It's why you wanna met watch Netflix because it's hard to be tender. It's hard to actually share your guts out. It's really hard to even right now, I would say this, and I don't know that y'all are probably, you're way cuter and younger, but it's probably easier for you. But for me, it's hard for me to pick going out over Netflix in my robe. Am I, that's not y'all. Y'all are like out on the town. <laughs> y'all are keeping everybody in business. Okay, good. Okay, so check, you're out. All right, so then once you're out, what David, you're asking me about is vulnerability. How do you get there? So the next thing is you have to say things that actually help you be known. Because if we're not, if it is not good for man to be alone, then it is not good for us to be alone in anything, in any secret, in anything that we're going through, it's not good. I'm not saying it's never good to be alone. Obviously, Jesus was alone, and David recommends we do the same thing. So I'm not saying there's not times that we be alone. But in general, there's a sense that our hearts get hard the longer we're alone. Some of you know this because you have a granddad that is alone, and, and he's cranky. And that's what happens. Like, we really do. We, t we trend towards being cranky. <laughs> And so the verse says, encourage each other as long as called today. Stir up courage. How do you stir up courage? I need to know what you're afraid of. If I'm gonna stir up courage for you, I have to know what you're afraid of. I think we should show him that Mad Libs thing. Oh, for sure. Because I think this is a good point to talk about vulnerability. Yeah. Yeah, Alex, throw it up. Yeah. So I, I told her, as we were talking before this, I think one of the challenges is putting language around being transparent and open and authentic. And I think at Watermark, we do a really good job of providing practical tools on being open about your dating relationship, purity, your finances, all of those things. And an area that I can struggle with is articulating the feelings that I have 
And I told her this was, this was helpful for me to read. So you want to expand on it? Yeah. So I wrote this because I'm really bad at sharing my heart. I'm really bad at doing, at, at, like if what happens, and my friends over there are going to be like, yeah, in fact, you can just amen because they all know. I'm not good at telling you how I feel. Like when I sit down and we're, we're going out, they're good. Like one of my friends over here, Lindsay, she cries. She'll call me in the middle of her cry. She'll be bawling and she'll call me and she'll be like, and I'm like, okay, I need to go over there. What's happening? I don't do that. I cry really hard by myself in my closet. (laughs) Then I get up and I think about it for a long time. And maybe by tomorrow, I'll tell you, I cried really hard in my closet yesterday. No, I'd probably leave out the closet because that's weird. But I'd say... (laughs) I'd say I cried really hard yesterday, but I'm not good at just off the cuff being like, you know what I feel? So I awkwardly did it to David back there, almost just because I knew we were going to talk about it. (laughs) Dave was like, how are you doing, Jenny? And I was like, honestly, I'm not very good. (laughs) He was like, okay. Thanks for being here. (laughs) I was like, yeah. Uh We had a bury of my cousin yesterday prematurely. We, Mm. you know, named a couple things, and I was like, I just feel kind of braced. Like, I don't know what's going on. He was like... Okay, and <laughs> but I did it somewhat unintentionally because I'm learning to awkwardly do it. I'm just gonna tell you right now. I think David genuinely wanted to know how I was. Did you? Um, yes. Okay. <laughs> of course, of course, of course, of course. I, I got the sense he kind of cared. Of course. <laughs> but I also have learned it's okay to be a little awkward. Hmm. And I will risk being awkward. I will risk being awkward with the chance I could feel connection than be fake and disconnected. Wow. That's good. And I think nothing we talk about tonight, nothing I wrote about, nothing is not awkward. It's all awkward. So I wrote this because I'm awkward and I'm not good at sitting down with my friends and telling them how I am. And so what they have to do, and they do often for me, is they, they basically say bull crap and that you're not telling the truth. They'll be watching me, they're like, I'm like, I'm good, everything's good, my kids are okay, like so-and-so's got a little problem. And they're like, bull. Mm. You, you're not telling the truth. I can tell, Jenny, you look not good, what's wrong? Thank you. But it's true. Something's just often wrong and, and something that I don't want to talk about. And so I wrote this for myself. We'll put it back up. And, and I wrote it because I thought, I almost am like a kindergartner. I just need to fill in the blank. So this is what I wrote. This week at work or at home, I was busy with blank. And I felt blank. I think I felt that way. I literally wrote this for myself, y'all. I'm not kidding. This was a fill in the blank so I would be more vulnerable. I think I felt that way because blank. I wish that blank would happen. Very few people know that blank is happening in my blank. Who knows, I need blank, but I'm afraid to ask for it. I'm hesitant to open up because, and this is where I wanna stop. We're gonna all answer that. And the greatest way you could love me right now is to blank. And those are the things, the simple little things. That's just, we could probably all fill that out pretty fast. But why is it so hard to say that to other people? Why are those parts of our lives, our fears, our thoughts, our struggles, like why are they so hard or awkward to say to each other and yet that's where courage can come in. That is what we're supposed to do together. If we're fighting something as ugly as the hardening of our hearts because of sin, it's a really cute verse, like you've probably seen it with flowers somewhere, somewhere. Encourage each other as long as it's called a day so that we're not hardened by sin's deceitfulness. But y'all, we're fighting the deceitfulness of sin. The deceitfulness of sin. That's what we're fighting by encouraging each other. And so those little things that we don't share with each other, that means we can't fight for each other. At the end of the day, you know, one of my fears in this book was I'm writing a book about friendship, and I'm like a really urgent person. Like, if I could go to war, I'd go. Except I wouldn't, because I don't like blood, or dying, or getting shot, or anything else. But I just mean, to, for, like, to matter. Like, just because 
you know, like just, it matters, it's important. I want to do things that are important. And so I'm writing a book about friendship. And I was like, I just, but I never felt that way about it because to me it was war. It was we're all so discouraged, we're all so tired, we're all so beat down, everybody's anxious, everybody's stuck, and we're all alone. And what if we weren't alone and that changed all the rest of the things? So the question, and, and we talked about backstage, the real question was, why am I hesitant to open up, which was one of the fill in the blanks. And I think there's lots of reasons, but you said one. Yeah, I mean, I think one thing you, you address, and we've talked about here, is one reason we feel alone is because we're not known. Yeah. And you can't be loved if you're not known. Because I, if I don't know the real you, then I can't actually love the real you. I can love a fake version of you, right. and you'll know in your head, oh, he loves, he says he loves me, but he really loves the version, cause he doesn't even really know me. Yeah. So that contributes to our loneliness, and there's barriers that make us unwilling to open up. And I said, I think one of the barriers that I can feel is not even a, a fear of being uh, known or being authentic, but being a burden. And I think often we can feel like, man, if we just all sit around and say everything that we're all carrying and put it on everybody, we're going to be here for 75 days, number one. And number two, like, they've got enough, you're carrying enough walking in here with all that your family and life. And so what would you say to somebody who is reluctant because they just don't want to make their problem somebody else's problems? So you gotta know who to share your problems with. Please don't share them with everybody. David, I awkwardly put in that position because we were about to talk about this. And I might have told you on another day too. I just think you like me more than maybe I you do. do. I do, I was kidding, <laughs> I love you. And of course I asked that in love. Um, so you gotta you know who. You gotta know, you can't do that with everybody. Guys, you know what, that's called a really cranky person. So don't do that. You gotta have your people. The difference in complaining and transparency and vulnerability is complaining seeks relief. Hmm. Transparency seeks healing and connection. When you're tr seeking vulnerability, to be vulnerable with someone else, you're seeking to, to be known by them, probably to know back from them something, you're seeking healing, you're, you're seeking maybe help, or you're seeking even help by just sharing it. You actually have pathways, why therapy lots of times works, is you have pathways that open up when somebody empathetically listens to you. So when somebody listens to you, like courage can come, that verse can come by sitting across from coffee with someone else and having them mirror feelings that you're feeling back to you. Not even saying anything, just, just empathetically listening to you. It's a lost art. We don't do this very well. But there's something in your brain that actually heals. Your wife's a counselor. Mm -hmm. When you do that across, it's why a lot of people pay for it. Because we're not very good at this. It's sad that we have to, and I'm certain there's times that you should. But what if we all became better counselors mm -hmm. <laughs> for each other? Kurt Thompson says, we come into the world looking for someone looking for us. And we never stop for the rest of our lives. We come in as babies, a baby comes out. It's in the world looking for someone looking for them. And so when you're sitting across from someone next time, I want you to think about that person as looking for you to look for them. Because we go at that wanting to get things because we're all so, we're starving for this. We're starving for connection. The, the three main things that we're looking for is to be seen, soothed, and safe, again from birth. Mm -hmm. But we always are, never stops. Seen, soothed, safe. That is actually the best premarital counseling anyone could ever give you guys, specifically the dudes. You make your wife feel seen, comforted, and safe, done. Anything you want forever. Like those women are happy. Because it's our, it's our deepest longing, it's, it's what we want, it's what we're craving. So when we find that in any kind of relationship, there's a sense of, I could share the thing that I don't wanna share. But it's still hard, and I would say it's always hard. It's still hard for me. Like, I was so bad at this that, um, yeah, I was really bad at this. And I've had to practice getting good at this. And it's, it's been, it's been practice. I don't know that there's another word for it. I, I'm not, I, my, mine isn't, isn't what you said, a little bit of what you said. I don't wanna take the oxygen out of the room. I don't, I don't wanna be a burden to people. I'd rather be there for them. 
but it was deeper than that. I, I think I didn't even want to know myself what was hard. Like, I don't even think mm -hmm. I wanted to admit to myself. And so what, what ends up happening is that's a hardening in itself too. And you cut yourself off and, and you cut yourself off from needing God. You cut yourself off from needing people. When I talked about villages earlier, I think about us and, and what they did for survival and what 80% of the world today does for survival, we could view that in an emotional sense right now. If everybody's lonely and everybody's disconnected and everybody's anxious and everybody needs that courage to be built up in them, I think we could just on a purely emotional level say this is so desperate that we're gonna get into each other's lives in a really profound way. That's good. There's five ingredients, and I wish we had more time to just go through all of this. But there's a couple other questions I want to ask, too. There are five ingredients of deep friendships that you described that I thought put language around those things in a really helpful way. Could you give us those five in really a sentence? You've named a couple of them already. So proximity, you got to do life together. Your friends out of town, you've got to have somebody that can look you in the eyes and say, hey, I don't think you're doing well. How can I help you? Um, the next one is vulnerability. You've got to be transparent with each other. They've got to know. And a lot of this I took from looking at villages that proximity, you know, w was the fires that people used to build in their villages and they'd all come together after the kids were in bed. They'd cook together. They'd, they'd do life together. In villages, if you go, there's, there's no doors. And so vulnerability is this idea of open doors and you live an open life with people that, that you're close to. Um, the next one is accountability. And that's the surprising one. Not at this church, we're really good at that, but most cultures aren't um, right now, yet throughout history they have been good at it. And you've seen, tr you know, there's tribal elders that, you know, when I took my son back to Rwanda, they, they grabbed him by the collar and they were all parenting him, like everyone, people we didn't even know, people on the streets were parenting my Rwandan son because that's what they do, they, they parent each other's kids, they help each other, hold each other accountable. And then the next one is a shared mission to do something beside each other, to do something arm in arm is very bonding. It helps you not feel alone. Now that could be at your workplace, that could be um, volunteering in children's ministry, which I highly recommend all of you should do. It could, do, it could be um, serving somewhere, but it also could just be playing pickleball. Like, and I don't, my mom does it with bridge. She, she's in a bridge club and she is on mission there with her friends, but they have a, a thing that they're doing together. And then the last one is consistency. That that you don't leave when it gets hard. And I think that probably might be the hardest part is we do tend to leave when it gets hard. And I think that's, you know, if I, if I look at problems today, that's another one just, we're, just friendships are disposable. If, if somebody hurts you, you, you walk away. But the reality is we were meant to work through conflict and conflict was actually supposed to help us get closer to each other. And so a good fight is actually defining of a good friendship. You can go through conflict together instead of bail and walk away. And so staying and being consistent and, and then clocking hours together. It takes about 200 hours for an acquaintance to become a good friend, an inner circle friend. So that just, for you to just quit someone that has made it to your inner circle, that means you're gonna have to start over and spend at least 200 hours developing a new friendship. So those are the five. So in this stage, I think you would say because when you're coming into young adulthood, you form these incredibly deep friendships in college, and then you leave yes. and you move to a new city and you're having to recreate, and you're, you're feeling like, I'm never gonna be as close to this community group as I was to my college roommate, you know, some of which you know, were believers and you had those deep connections. And I think you would say, you've got to fight for those types of relationships. They may have come more naturally when you, you know, shared a dorm room or shared a house with six of you living, but today, because you're not in that environment, uh, you can still have friends that live somewhere else, but you've got to fight today. So to the person who's saying, man, I feel like I'm fighting, but it's not reciprocated, or I feel like I'm always the one initiating, what would you say? I'd say my dream and my prayer for this project has been that tens of thousands of initiators are sent into the world mm -hmm. because the initiators are the people that can change everything. And if you want friends, which some of you are introverts and you're like, I wish I didn't even show up tonight. Listen, you are actually better at this than you think. You're actually really good at that inner circle. You're good at that deeper connection. 
And, and God says it's not good for you to be alone either. So it's not that you, you don't need to be alone, it's that you don't need to be alone all the time. And so you're pursuing this with the margin that you have for people as much as you can. But I would just say that initiating can change everything. I've heard stories recently because some of the people got the book early and the stories they've said are things like this. I was sitting next to this, these few women every single week, we were watching our kids do gymnastics and we would just scroll our phones. And she said, but because I was reading this book, I, I just talked to the person next to me for 30 minutes while we were sitting there anyway. And we completely bonded, she completely opened up to me and we have game night on the calendar next week with, with our husbands. Like this is how the world changes. You just notice who's right in front of you. That village is supposed to be the people that, that you don't think much about, but they're probably in and out of your life on a daily basis anyway. They're probably coming to mind right now and you text them and say, hey, I really wanna set a more regular time to see you because I don't, sometimes I go a week without seeing the same people week in and week out and that makes me sad. And I just wanna know that every week I'm gonna see you and we're gonna hang out together. Whatever the small change is, a girl today stopped me outside and said, um, I bought a fire pit because of your book and and I bought a fire pit in my backyard and my husband and I just started inviting people over because a fire is a great thing. You could just sit there and look at it. Like it's so fun to look at fire. <laughs> Love it. Love looking at fire. And, and then you don't have to cook for them. Like tops, you know, s'mores, like keep them in your pantry. That's what we do. And, and so you, you don't have to make this hard. You know, this can be little changes that you walk out and make, but it will require what you're saying, which is initi initiation. If you don't initiate, you will not have friends. That's good. I wanna give you a chance to say anything else you'd leave them with. I, I'd love to put that chart up one more time because I, I think that in a society, as a culture, we're so feelings driven yeah. often, and we're also ironically feelings illiterate in that we don't often take the time to be introspective and actually navigate, um, and not just listen to my feelings, yeah. but to listen to them in a way of, hey, what is this actually telling me? And to be a good enough friend that sits there with you. And I think one thing that I was challenged, not that one, the, uh, the um, what did you call it? W I called it Mad Libs, emotional Mad Libs. Mad Libs. <laughs> that to, I think you would say, hey, if you fill this out, or if someone shares something like this with you, there's, there's a balance between immediately correcting them and telling them not to feel that way, and also just giving them the space and creating that environment and saying, yeah. man, that, that, is, that must be really hard. And that's not always something I'm great at. In fact, I think as a culture, we could probably grow in the church of doing that better. But what's the balance between, you know, somebody shares this and then you're speaking into it and also just trying to foster an environment where they can share that. And you guys, it may be wise, honestly, take a picture of this right now and share with your community and talk with your community about the things. This may be the most profound thing, honestly, you walk out of here with. And yeah. it at least yeah. was profoundly helpful in terms of language for me. But I think I'm asking... What, how do you incorporate this and still be a faithful friend? And so I actually, uh, actually I'm gonna share something that I want you to do tonight. Y'all are young, I don't care what time you have to wake up tomorrow, you're going out tonight, and let me tell you why. You are, that's your assignment. You're going out. How about that? You're going out. You're gonna grab, I'm serious, I don't care if they're strangers, you're gonna grab Four or five people. I know, somebody's gonna get married because I just did this. I want you to grab I, no more than five, six people, okay? Sit at a table together. I want you to go out tonight. Here's why. One of my friends is here. Her grandmother wrote her a letter this, uh, uh, th well, today's 2 22 The next time this will happen is 3-33-3033 that there's this many numbers in a day. And she said, this won't happen for a thousand plus years. Thousand plus years that you'll have a date like you have today. It's funny, I don't know. She said, she hand wrote these letters to her grandkids. She said, I want you to do something you'll never forget on 2-22-22. For the rest of your life, you'll tell your grandkids on 2-22-22, I did this thing, okay? What you're, I'm, I'm gonna give you your thing tonight. You're going out, and you're gonna be vulnerable, awkwardly so, and you're never gonna forget it, and you're gonna sit across from each other, and you're gonna celebrate, and I don't know what that looks like for you if it's like cooking s'mores or what, but you're gonna celebrate, you're gonna do something, and we, you know, I'm, I'm, we're at church, but you know, just whatever you gotta do, 
that you're gonna celebrate. And you're gonna, you're gonna do that tonight and you're gonna do, I'd say you all take that with you and you try to answer it. Like take a picture of it. Can we put it back up one more time in case now they realize I might get married. So I'm gonna answer the question. <laughs> And you're gonna share with each other the answer that this isn't, this isn't a big deal, but it is actually what's really going on behind right. the things going on. That's what I want you to learn. If you share the thing that's going on behind the things that are going on, you have connection. Mm. And what happens when you start to have connection is your anxiety goes down. I don't know how it happens. You could tell me, your, your wife could tell me, but physically, it happened to me the other night. I started to share the things behind the things that were going on, and I took a deeper breath, and my shoulders rolled back, and I, was, I just could breathe better. And so you're gonna do that tonight, and you're gonna go somewhere right now. You're gonna pull out your phone and text somebody in the room. You have to have been in the room. You can't do it with other people, because they're gonna be bugged. You only can do it with the people in the room. Will y'all do this, for real? Come on, go to Sonic, it's open. <laughs> People are like pointing to girls, like I'm gonna go with her, I'll go with her, I don't care. Because the point is this, that you can do it. The point is we can go deeper. The point is next time you're gonna run an errand alone, you could ask a friend to go with you. The point is, instead of working out by yourself in the morning, you can make a little workout group. The point is, you can make choices that cause you to not be so disconnected. That's right. That is my prayer for you. And that you all go share your souls out and fall in love. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. All right, it, what would you leave him with? And that may be it. That's and, it. And we pray. Man, that... That 222-22 thing, I'm like, <laughs> we gotta go do something. Celebrate. This is gonna be a thousand years. Where am I gonna tell my grandkids? <laughs> I'm going to Sonic and I am getting rid of my toaster. <laughs> oh man, that's such a gift. I, um, I, can I share one thing and then will you pray for us? And then the band, band, you guys can come up. Is I'm gonna have Jenny in and then you guys can play. Um, Today at my house, my wife called me during lunch and I was talking to Sam and she said, there's a gas leak in our house. It smells like gas like crazy. She's got a three week old, two, our other two kids. And I'm talking to, I'm in a meeting and I'm, I basically was trying to go, hey, I'll call you right back. And she goes, you're not calling me back. There's a gas leak, it smells like gas. And I'm like, okay, Sam, I'm leaving the meeting. And I'm walking out and Sam says, you should tell her to call 911. You should call 911. And so I, of course I call 911 and get to the house and long story short, everything ended up being okay, but they went through and they tested it and basically confirmed what the problem was. And it's kind of irrelevant, but everything was fine. And I share that because whenever there's a situation where there's a, a fire, there's a problem, there's something going on, we, we know what to do. We know who to call, 911. And really what I love about this book is when it comes to the challenges and problems and heartaches and heartbreaks and uh, highs and lows of life, there isn't a 911 to call. But God has given us the yeah. blueprint in his word to instruct us on how to create the relationships of the people that come around you. Because when you're going through a catastrophic thing, you're not gonna call me, you're not calling Jenny. If you were here, we'd pray for you and come alongside. But you have the chance to have people in your life that know you intimately in a way that nobody on a stage ever will. But you can be known. And you can experience a peace that comes from that. And so it's an easy thing. And I, I told you, and I hope this doesn't insult you, I've done community here a long time. It's Watermark's middle name. Yeah. And, and I was so encouraged as I just saw ways that I want to be more connected to those that I run with and experience more of the connection God designed us to experience. Mm -hmm. So thank you for articulating and creating a resource I think is gonna really serve the church. I would highly recommend to everyone here. And um, with that said, will you pray for us? Yeah. <laughs> I will. God, you, you built us. You do this, you are this. I mean, you are Father, Son, Holy Spirit. You always were, you always will be. Like you in yourself are communal, it's who you are. And so we come before a communal God, knowing that we are communal creatures that are craving something that you set in us. This is a good thing that we are craving. 
This is not something evil. This is something good. In fact, we are not meant to live alone. And for every way we have lived independent, isolated, built fences in our lives, around our souls, God, would you tear them down and would we be brave enough to open the door, to let people in, to, to imagine what it could look like to imagine what it could look like if we were truly known, if we were truly seen, if we were truly soothed and safe, God. That's what you desire for us. That's how, that's how you actually change us. That's how our hearts change. It's how they don't harden up. It's how they don't get callous. God, we, we take a deep breath and we say something awkward and we, we admit it's hard. And as we do that, we feel a deep breath, and, and as we do that, the person across from us thinks, hey, maybe I am safe here. Maybe I could share my thing. And we defeat the devil together. God, we want to see the darkness and the bondage fall in our lives, and and we know that your word says that you've not given us a spirit of fear, but that you've given us a spirit of power, of love, and self-discipline. And God, I believe the reason we are in so much fear is that we're trying to fight the fear alone. And so God, I pray tonight, I pray tonight that there would be awkward conversations happening all over Dallas all over Austin, all over the places where people are watching God on this night <laughs> that won't happen again for a thousand years. God, I pray that bondage would fall and the way it falls, God, that we wouldn't overcomplicate it, that we'd listen. Most of us know the, the answer to our problems. Most of us know the truth. But most of us haven't been seen and soothed and safe in a long, long time. So would we be people that provide that? Make spaces like that, that cry with each other, mourn with each other, laugh with each other, hug each other, and be together, encouraging each other as long as it is called today. You've got a good plan. Help us live it out. In Jesus' name, amen.